Thanks for coming like you had a choice, uh, but I saw it. And it's so exciting because we haven't seen each other all summer. It's like the inverse of summer camp. It's so great the first day of school. I'm Randy Watson, Commissioner of Education, and we're going to have some fun, but I, I need you to play all out with me this morning. So a couple of things. Uh, first of all, this, this is going to age me a little bit, but just recently, I was in Topeka at the Ramada Inn, and I went into the lobby, and there was my favorite rock group of all time, Chicago, right there. And for those of, those of you a little bit younger, you're thinking that was a ballad band in the 80s. I'm just here to tell you, uh, they were long before that. But I said, what? You're my favorite group. I've seen you a thousand times, and why didn't I not know that you were going to be in Topeka tonight? Well, of course, they didn't know why I didn't know they were going to not be in Topeka. But next thing I knew, I had front row seats to see Chicago, which was great. And you know what? They cost a lot of money. So you guys that got here early to get the back row, teachers, you missed the most important high-dollar seats. And as any good teacher, if I could invert this room, I would right now on you, right? right? All right. So I need you to, to shut your laptops, kind of... Get your phones, because you, you may want to tweet out, and you may want to get some things going, because uh, we're going we're gonna to share lots of things together. And let's get started with a little video clip. The number one thing that will make us thrive in Kansas is to provide world-class education to each and every child. Whatever it is, we want them to problem solve it and attack the situation have the confidence and feel prepared to do it. Every child is looked at as an individual, and every child is given the right and the opportunity to succeed. Really what it means to make sure that every kid is prepared is that they have the opportunity to dream and that they have the skills to realize those dreams. When I grow up, I hope to be a singer or an actress. We have to maintain our commitment to programming like the arts, choirs, bands, all the other things that we don't necessarily think of as core areas. We have an opportunity before us that the State Board is setting forth that says test scores are important, but they shouldn't be what drives our work. What should drive our work is what our kids need, who they are and who they can become. Not only do we have a strong literacy, communication, math skill foundation, but education and educators instill a hope, the ability to dream something bigger. We're not just applying a standard to all kids, but we're looking at where they are in, as individuals, and we're helping them grow, and we're helping them achieve. I know a lot more Spanish. I didn't know how to read, write, and now I do. We have quality administrators, school board members, state board of education members that are wholly dedicated to the cause of public education. What I like about my teachers is that they're very kind and they're very helpful. Kansans can lead the world in student success as we focus on the needs of our kids and we think forward and we're innovative and we allow ourselves to dream with our kids and to make sure that their supports are in place. Kansans can do anything we put our minds to. Kansans can make all things possible. Kansans can achieve anything they set their mind to. Kansas can do anything. Love that video we put together a couple years ago uh, to highlight this work that we're doing. So I need you, remember I said I need you to play all out today. So we're going to start with a little quiz, and I'm not going to call on you, so you don't have to worry about being right or wrong. I'm trying to get a sense for what you do know or you don't know, and you don't have to apologize if you know it or you don't know it. But I'm going to ask you this, how many of you have never heard of the name Betsy DeVos. Raise your hand. About <laughs> uh, four. Okay, with a lot of chuckles. 
All right. And so, so about four and about another probably 15 or 20 that said, he's lying, I'll raise my hand, he'll call on me, I've been through this before, right? All right, how many of you have never heard of the name Jim Porter? Raise your hand. All right, I don't know what the ratio is, but let's just say that there are more people who don't know who Jim Porter is than Betsy DeVos. So, Betsy DeVos is the current United States Secretary of Education. For those of you that did not raise your hand, that are still wondering who that was, and Jim Porter is the chairman of the State Board of Education. And I say this because this is, I think, illustrative of many of the things that we're going to talk about this morning, such as we just had a primary election in Kansas all throughout the state, and less than 10% of voters voted in that election. We cannot sustain a democracy that doesn't know what's going on in their backyard. Jim Porter is the chairman of the State Board of Education. He has much greater control over your professional life than Betsy DeVos, all right? And we know that because the state board has issued a pretty bold challenge, and good or bad, we don't really care what Betsy DeVos says. Okay, is that okay? Yeah, all right? So we have a unique Kansas thing. And here's two people that represent you on that board, Steve Roberts Steve, and Janet Waugh. Yeah, they just came out today to support you. By the way, by the way, these, these 10 people are elected, and they're some of the most liberal people politically you'd ever want to meet. Right, Janet? Some, liberal. <laughs> and they're some of the most conservative people you'd ever want to meet. Right, Steve? <laughs> I'm just pointing this out. And they would tell you, we struggle, we will struggle tomorrow to get a 10-0 vote to approve the agenda. So they don't agree very often. And what we're going to talk about is unanimous, 10-0, that this is where Kansas should go. This is uniquely yours, and it's our vision going forward. So I, I'm begging for your help. So if you started your career in education, whether it's here in Shawnee Mission or somewhere else, if you started your career prior to the year 2011, raise your hand. Ooh. Okay, is it okay just for this morning? if we call you veterans, is that okay? <laughs> Otherwise, we gotta call you old and I'm in that category, so I, it's okay? All right, how many of you started your career from 2011 to, the, to today? Raise your hand. Okay, so I'm from Southeast Kansas, this is an endearing term. Is it okay just for this morning if we call you youngins? Okay, <laughs> it really is. Now veterans, veterans, I know we're gonna stretch your minds today. I know it's hard. You've had the summer off. Some of you have early onset dementia. Okay, but we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna stretch you because you're gonna have we're gonna have to teach the youngins a few things, and and it's I will tell you there are things that you know, but they may be deep in the recesses of your brain that you haven't used recently. Okay, we're gonna have to we're gonna have to do something because youngins are only gonna know a period of time called No Child Left Behind, and veterans you're gonna remember a time before No Child Left Behind. And you know how you remember that time? We used to value your opinion. <laughs> Just saying, is that right? Yeah, yeah, we used to value your opinion. And then since then, all we cared about was a math and reading score, right? So you remember a time when we came back from Christmas that you didn't go on steroids and, and say, hey, forget recess, forget art, forget music. Right? Forget science PE. We're on a mission to take the delta indicators and do well on the test. Right? You remember a time when we have to do that. So you're going to have to help our youngins as we, as we go forward. So, veterans, anyone go to a one-room schoolhouse? This even predates Dale Dennis, for those of you who know Dale. He's only been with us 50 years. This is what Kansas schools look like, looked like from the time of territory through early statehood. This is a one-room schoolhouse in, in Kansas. Here's one just south of Wamego, still there, by the way. And I thought at the time, when I was doing a little research on this, I thought, wow, what a cool looking limestone building. I mean, that, they've got it going versus these poor kids out in Thomas County, a stinking sod one-room schoolhouse. 
One room schoolhouses were built on sections of land with whatever materials were native to that area. And so, you know, if you look at the limestone, it wasn't because it was nicer, that's what they had right outside of Manhattan. And they only had sod out in Goodland, so we got, we got to go somewhere else. And you know what's so cool about Kansas, the Kansas City area, is that for most of the greater Kansas City area, when we were talking about this area, we were out in the country, right? You know, the fastest growing school district right now is Spring Hill, and it certainly was the country. I mean, it was far in the country. So this was education. How many grades were in the one-room schoolhouse? No, not all of them. Eight. That's a lot of them. Grades one through eight, because we hadn't brought kindergarten over from the Germany yet. So there's no rugs and, and you know, milk and cookies. That's what all kindergarten was when I was in school. <laughs> right? What would you like to be? I don't know, but when's, when's nap time? Right? Get a little milk and cookies. And most kids, we stopped in eighth grade. Because at the, in 100 years ago, only less than 20% of Kansas kids went to high school. Because you didn't need to. Our whole economy in this state was built upon agriculture and artisan work. So if I wanted to be a blacksmith, I just went. I worked for a blacksmith. He trained me how to be a blacksmith, and after three or four years, I got to become a blacksmith. It was an artisan base or a, uh, an agricultural-based system. How many teachers? Well, uh, more, because the older kids taught the younger kids. Yes, they did. The older kids. Amazing that that happened, right? Now we couldn't do it unless, you know, we did cooperative learning and you study think pair share because, you know, we'd have to have training in that. But it's just, they did it. The younger kids taught the older kids because there's only one teacher. And you can see, boys are renegade kids right there, you know. And that's what school was. And I bring that up because I remember my great-grandmother uh, when I was a young boy, and she was telling me about the old days. And she said, Randy, I went to that Robin's One Room Schoolhouse. It was a great schoolhouse, and she was telling me about, about the school, and they loved, loved us, and uh, we went to you know, eighth grade. And then we brought the kids, and this is uniquely Kansas, we brought the kids to town. Doesn't that sound just like what we're doing? We brought them to town, and we created something that all of you teach in today, grade schools. We didn't have grade schools before. For over 100 years, we didn't have grade schools. We had one-room schoolhouses. And I don't think anyone went to eighth grade graduation with an air horn, shot it off, and go, we made it. <laughs> Most of our schools in Kansas today, we still have eighth grade recognition or eighth grade graduation. Most parents and most kids, they don't even understand. Why would we do that? Well, it's an honoring of history. And it's one of the challenges as we go forth uh, in this, in this uh, work is that we love the nostalgia of school. You know, my school in Coffeeville, my elementary school, is still standing. It's a church, but I still love to drive by it because it's just, it just the memories, you know. And uh, years ago, I got to go in and, uh, and revisit it. And the smells of the school, you know, every school has a unique smell. And it just, it just took me back to a different time. So this, this, uh, it, it's important that that will get in the way of our change. The other thing. We're going to be talking today a lot about change of which most of you don't see. Here's the reason. How many of you, since you started your adult career in teaching, that this is all you've done? You've, you've taught your adult life. You haven't done anything else. Raise your hand. Okay. There are two professions that are not fundamentally going to change over the next 25 years, teaching and health care. They're going to be extremely personal. They're about relationships and they primarily won't change. Every other occupation is going to change dramatically and already is. I'm going to point that out. So this is, this is one of the reasons it's hard. We have nostalgia about, the, about what's always been. We, we're teaching in a system of which we can only see that, hey, new group of kids coming in this week, and a new group of kids coming in next year. And the other thing I'm going to ask you to do today is I know what you're thinking. You're like, Doggone it. I wish he'd shut up and wish they would just let me go work in my classroom and get ready, right? I get it. 
I have a daughter who's an elementary art teacher in Great Bend, and my wife's an elementary principal, and I'm a former high school teacher, so I, I think of myself in those terms, and I've set where you are. I'm not asking you to change your classroom. You know, flexible seating, and we've got new uh, iPads, and we've got a, I've got a new idea about something we're going to teach. That's what we've been doing. We're going to ask you today to think about changing the system, and we never do that. Here's what we do. We say, you know what? Education's not doing so well in America, not doing so well in Kansas, and guess who we blame for that? You. Me. Right? Stinking teachers, stinking principals. Who's the commissioner of education? Let's go fire all those people. And you know what I see? You've never worked harder in your life. And you, I've never met a group of people in Kansas, and I, I've spent my whole life here, that have dedicated their lives solely on helping other people's kids. You need to be commended for that. But here's the stark reality. You can't change your classroom enough to meet the demands of the future. It's got to be, we've got to rethink the system. Just like when the one-room schoolhouse came to town, we created grade schools that every eight-year-old was going to be in second grade that we're going to have middle schools and high schools later on. So I'm going to try to paint that picture for you and show you where Kansas is headed. And ask for your help, because unlike maybe past initiatives, past things, this is uniquely has to be about teachers. We're trying to flatten this organization called Hierarchy of School. I'm trying to do it in our agency. It's extremely difficult, where everyone's voice counts, and your voice is going to matter. And it's, you're going to struggle with that because you know how to change your classroom. You know, I, ooh, I've got the new posters for this year. It's going to be really cool. I've got a new color scheme. <laughs> but now we're going to ask you to think about systems. So it is time to think pair share. So I want you to turn to your neighbor, and I want you to, to get right. Who is this man that changed education forever? Don't yell it out yet. Talk to your neighbor. Make sure you come up with the right answer. Go. Better get this right. Okay. All right. This man. Now. Before we give the answer, who knows with 100% certainty who this man is? Raise your hand. One, two. Not 100%. Not 100%. Typical elementary teachers wouldn't bet the farm on this. If we were going to Vegas, though, you're going to bet the farm, right? You're all in. You're all in. And it's like Phil Donahue, for those of you that are old. Okay? All right. And the answer. See, I said I wouldn't call on you, I lied. <laughs> this time I am. Okay, are you ready? Sure. The answer is? Henry Ford. Henry Ford? Oh, it's so good. So good. If I had shown this, that's right. Oh, I can ask that in Shawnee Mission. I go over to Blue Valley and they make it up. They miss it. Not Shawnee Mission, though. Hey, Model T. You can have it in any color you want, as long as it's black. All right? So when Henry Ford decided to invent the Model T, cars were made one at a time, customized. They cost three years' salary. So who could afford cars? The wealthy. The wealthy. So my grandparents, great-grandparents, my great-grandparents, how did they get around? Horse and buggy. All right? My, my grandma, this is on my mom's side. My grandmother on my mom's side is Bertha, and my grandfather's Orville. Well, what better period pieces, names than that, right? And my great-grandmother, telling the story, my grandfather picked Orville, picked my grandmother up, Bertha, to go to a silent movie in a Model T. And my, my great-grandmother says, I don't know about that thing. I don't think they're very reliable. I got a horse out here. I'd rather you take the horse. And she says, Bertha? you make sure that you come home, and sure enough, it broke down. 
And my grandmother has to say, Orville, I'm not that kind of girl. I mean, all of us know what happened in the back seats of cars, but you know, this was new. This was new. And by the way, you can't even think of your grandparents doing that, right? They're like, no, no. Henry Ford changed America because he invented something called the assembly line. He said, you know what? We're going to take all these farmers and we're going to take these artisans. We're going to put them in factories and we're going to make this assembly line so we can cut our costs down and we're going to hire people that just have basic skills, basic math, basic literacy, and they're going to put a tire on a car. Put a tire on a car. Don't put the lug nuts. Don't talk to the person next to you. Sound like school? Don't talk to the person next to you because you're going to screw them up. You do your job. I'm going to pay you really well. You're going to work all of your life in this company. You're going to have a pension. You're going to buy a, you know, a nice house, have a dog and a cat, two kids, and it's going to be great. Right? Wichita did that in the aircraft industry. $80 an hour, sheet metal workers. No skill. All right? Henry Ford changed America. And so when we brought the kids to town, we emulated that system. Right? We're second grade teachers. What happens after you have your kids this year? Where do they go? Third grade. New teacher. Then where do they go? Fourth grade. They go to fifth grade. When we get to middle school, we organize around age and time and academic subjects, right? You know, you know what happens in all middle schools and high schools, some elementaries. A phenomenon happens that's over 100 years old. A bell rings. <laughs> you know what happens. You, you pick up your crap and you go to the next subject, right? <laughs> and then, right? And then you, you got four minutes to go to the bathroom, talk to your friends, and get in your seat or your tardy. And that happens in some elementary schools too, because it's organized around this system. Basic literacy, do well, everything's going to be great. Here's the problem. That's not the world today. It's not even the world of the future. It's not the world today. I was just at the editorial boards of the major newspapers in Kansas this week. I'm going to share with you a couple of stories. So I was at the Kansas City Star, the Lawrence Journal World, the Wichita Eagle, uh, the Topeka Capital Journal. Kansas City Star, moving out of their building. Wichita Eagle just imploded their building. Cargill's going to build a new one. They went down. They're all downsizing. They're, they told me, journalism majors coming, they told me, this is the week, journalism majors coming out of college don't have the skills that we need in today's journalism market. It's totally different. We're going to talk about that. Because you know what this is? School. 19, 1940s, Kansas. These are all Kansas pictures. How about the 50s? You know, sir, it's all black school. This is a Monroe school. If you go to Monroe School in Topeka today, you'll know that's where Brown versus Board of Education is housed. You know, we're unique. Isn't that unique, I think, that we have that in our history? How about the 60s? How about the 70s? We're now integrated. That was big. You notice a pattern here, how we look? How about 2017? Now, what you notice difference is we finally have a student with disabilities in the classroom. But other than that, we're still in rows. Oh, we went from slate to a whiteboard to a smart board. I walk in a lot of classrooms, elementary in particular, where I watch most teachers using a smart board, and we could have done it with chalk. Because the district bought them without asking you. Right? I mean, was, we had an initiative. There's a lot of technology going on. It's not necessarily bad or good. But I'm just saying, school looks primarily the same. It's all based around Henry Ford. But have you noticed this? Gardner Edgerton, Kansas City, Kansas, this is an Amazon distribution center. Right here in your backyard. What do you notice about the Amazon distribution center? Yeah, there's actually two guys right down here at the bottom. You can barely see. There's not very many people. Look at this one. It's the Amazon distribution center. These are robots. So years ago, I had a little part-time job in the summer working at Western Publishing Company outside of Coffeeville, where Amazon bought and had a place until it left Kansas so we could call, create new jobs. If you're in southeast Kansas, you know they weren't new jobs. They all left, and then they came up to northeast Kansas. But I did some of this. I stopped shelves. You know, I put them and then took, did a forklift and put them on a truck, and the truck this is all automated. 
So has the world changed? How many of you, a few weeks ago, bought something on Prime Day? Raise your hand. Oh, it's the largest retail day in the history of America. Prime Day. You sit and you're a lazy boy, you're on your deck, you're out on your boat, you're laying in bed, and you ordered, it was really good. You didn't have to shower, you didn't have to look good. <laughs> How many of you have been to a mall lately? Have you noticed what's happening to the mall all across the country? I spent time in Salina, excuse me, McPherson the last 23 years, and I just learned this past weekend that the Dillard store in Salina is going out of business. That's the anchor store for that mall. Right? Here in the Kansas City area, remember the great malls of the 60s and 70s? Boy, the one, White, White Lakes Mall, go drive around that in Topeka next time you're in Topeka. Just a shell, nothing in it. Big parking lot. So the retail giant of our generation, whether you're a youngin' or you're a veteran, the retail giant of our generation is? Walmart. Walmart. And a few weeks ago, we had the biggest retail day in our history created on an app. Amazon recently bought Whole Foods. I don't know if you knew that. And you know what happens, it's happening right now. It's happening right now, you walk, you walk around your house. Alexa, I need some toilet paper. Alexa, I need some kitty litter. And the next day it's on your door. And if you're living in Chicago, that happens in two hours. And Amazon wants to get to where anywhere in Kansas will at least be one day, and anywhere in America will be within an hour. That's their goal. What do you think is gonna happen to Walmart? Can you see it? Um, this is what's happening today. So if we're a third grade teacher, if we're a third grade teacher, it's gonna be interesting to see what happens in the future. This is what Amazon's trying to do. They're investing in drone technology. They want to deliver your package in less than an hour if possible. In rural Kansas, it'll still be a day. It's two days right now. Anywhere in the world, it's two days. They'd like to get drone technology. Why? Why would Amazon automate and go to drone technology? Just because it's kind of Jetson cool? It's cheaper. it's cheaper. And guess who loses jobs if they're successful in this? UPS, FedEx. Think how much money they make. It's pretty good living. It's hard, but it's pretty good living. High school educated. You see where I'm going? What if they eliminate those jobs? By the way, what company in Kansas, a Kansas company, has invested millions of dollars in drone technology? They're not using it yet, but they've invested millions of dollars in drone technology. Pizza Hut. <laughs> so they can deliver your pizza. Now, I'm thinking, my kid will be out there, right? Your kid will be out there with some app diverting it, right? Trying to change its trajectory. But pizza Hut wants to deliver your pizza, not by someone with a car. So who gets displaced by that? How many of you have ever rode Uber? Oh, my gosh. Are you kidding me? Elementary teachers, veterans, we've spent our entire career telling kids, don't get in the cars of strangers. <laughs> and then what did you do? You got on your phone. You punched a nap at the airport. You said, please pick me up. I'm already going to pay you so that you can wander around town and get lost. You're not going to make any more money off of me. And I get in the car. I've never met you. What happened to stranger danger? <laughs> Less than 10 years old. Totally transformed the taxi business, which was full-time, regulated, yellow cabs, you know. Now it's part-time work whenever you want to. Your vehicle, cut cost, it's cheaper, it's faster, it's all technology, right? Think about that. Who gets displaced? Taxi drivers. You see what's happening? This is happening all around us. You notice it when you're purchasing something. You don't notice it so much when kids come to school because we're uniquely a different type of, uh, of environment. So here's what Uber's trying to do, along with other people. Google, Apple, GM, Ford, billions of dollars, 
being poured into the driverless car. Now, veterans, I know you're going, ain't no way I'm getting in a driverless car. Well, I don't know. You're getting in cars with strangers, and you're okay with that. <laughs> Think about this. Think about if even if they can capture 10 or 15 percent of the market in urban markets, Think of who that displaces. And think of the, how the job market changes. So, you know, as we think about this, how many of you, well, let's talk about this. You know this company, right? iPads. It's, it's a computer company, except it's not. How many of you own an iPhone? Raise your hand. iPhone, iPad, music, apps, that's where Apple makes all their money. It was invented and launched in the summer of 2007. The class of 2017 were second graders when this came out. They will tell the story at their 10 year reunion. Hey, you remember, we're old people. We didn't have an iPhone. So here's, so, so you, hey, here's the innovators. Here's the innovators in the crowd. You're saying, you know what? We ought to be coding. We ought to be doing stuff, you know, coding apps and stuff. Guess what? This won't be the technology when they graduate. It's not what we're teaching, it's how we're teaching and how kids are going to have to relearn things that are going to be so important. It's why the publisher at the Kansas City Star says, along with the Wichita Eagle and the Lawrence Journal World, the journalism majors coming out aren't the skill sets I need. They know journalism, so I can train apps. I, I, how do I know this? Veterans, remember this? I'm in a summer class, 1981, microcomputers in education. Now, this was really helpful. I'm in a master's class. They taught me how to program in basic an Apple IIe. Like, I was really going to do that the rest of my life. I'm a history teacher. Why? Because they thought you would code it, write your own software. No one was going to do that. We were going to buy software to use. Now it's just all in the cloud. But that's how they trained us. I mean, that's, that's, that's like in my era, well, let's, let's spend a semester showing you how to use an overhead projector. <laughs> or an opaque. Or veterans, beep. <laughs> at the film strip. And you know, hey, veterans, you know what the really cool thing was? We're ditto masters. The only place in, in school where you can get high and it's legal. <laughs> right? I mean, right there. Right? You, the young, young people are going, ditto, masters. <laughs> purple, purple ink all over yourself. This is a report given to President Obama two months before he left office, his economic advisors. Two months before he left office. 83% chance that workers earning $20 or less will have their job automated. You can go to Bloomberg. They have a nice interactive chart that will show you all those jobs and wages and within the next decade, how many of those are going to be automated. Think if you've been to Applebee's or Chili's or, or Friday's or any of those recently, those little things on your, on your table. You remember, veterans, you'll remember this. In our era, that was the ANW and the Sonic, right? But now, right now, they just make you swipe and pay there. But they soon want you to order there, and the waiter and waitress will be extinct. These are millions of jobs that kids have today, both part-time and full-time. From the Georgetown Policy Institute last week, fresh, fresh data. The number of good jobs held by workers with no more on a high school diploma has declined by 1 million since 1991. It's not going to be good enough just to graduate high school. We'll talk about that. It's not good enough. And yet, associate degree jobs have grown by 3 million. That's the gap. It's a tremendous gap. Again, Georgetown Policy Institute. In the heyday of Henry Ford's America, you just got laid off and then you withstood the test of time. Any of you who know the Wichita market, this was really true of the aircraft industry because they paid so well. But they did this, right? 
Then they laid you off. You just, you just held out because they're going to hire you back until Airbus started kicking Boeing's tail economically, and then that changed. This is what Georgetown Policy Institute's one-week-old research, those days are gone. So when, I'm just going to be honest with you, I grew up in Southeast Kansas. Any other Southeast Kansas kids here? Okay, so you know Big Brutus? Okay, Big Brutus is large steam shovel, all right, West Mineral, Kansas. And so I'm listening to President Trump recently, he's in West Virginia, talking about bringing back coal mining jobs. I got excited, I'm thinking, shoot, we're gonna fire Big Brutus back up, put it back to work. <laughs> no, we're not. We're not. And why are coal miners mad about that? Because they had good employment with a high school education, they didn't like the job. They're mad they don't have the job, right? It's gone. Big Brutus, we're not firing Big Brutus back up. We can say that, sometimes, you know, we say things politically, the world is changing, and it's already changed. So we've got to think about that. Research from ACT, 1979, a worker, 30-year-old, with a baccalaureate degree, makes 17% more money than a worker with a high school diploma. My dad retired from the Missouri Pacific Railroad in 1994. He was making just under $90,000 a year as a brakeman switchman. So tonight, if you get stopped by a train whenever you're going home, don't get mad. Sit there and just enjoy the view, because you will clearly see visually that the job that my dad had that paid so well with a high school education is no longer available to any of the kids that will come into your classrooms this year. And you know how I know that? Visually. There's no caboose, and that's where he spent his life, was on the caboose. 1979, that's the gap. 2004, 25 years later, the gap had grown to 50%. It took 25 years to move from 17 to 50%. Today, it's 80%. There's an 80% gap in wage difference. I think this speaks volumes to why high school graduates and high school dropouts in this country are mad. They've lost their jobs. They've lost their buying power. They've lost the middle class is shrinking rapidly without some form of post-secondary education. Now, that, I'm not here to say there's not good jobs with high school education. There's much fewer than there was even 10 years ago. So just think about that. We're going to have to do something different in this thing we call school. So let's, let's set the stage for what the state board's been working on. For all of human history, the primary focus of education has been acquiring more content knowledge. And the only way to get it is through the teacher, right? You don't have to do that anymore. Today, content is ubiquitous. It's free. It's on every internet-connected device. And it's growing exponentially and changing constantly. The world simply no longer cares how much our kids know. What the world cares about is what they can do with what they know, which is a completely different education problem. When we were growing up, parents and teachers talked about work ethic, that you really had to want to work hard. But it turns out in the 21st century, work ethic isn't good enough. You can't just intend to work hard. You actually have to know what to do next yourself. You have to be motivated and you have to have knowledge about what is the next step I ought to be taking. If we can compete with other countries, it's got to be in producing citizens capable of innovative thinking. Not citizens capable of industrial production, not citizens capable of assembling iPads. We're going to lose if that's what we think we're producing. The old blue-collar industrial model of education is already gone. We're already living in its wake. So what is everyone looking for? They're looking for people who can do critical thinking and problem solving, dot, 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 in order to get an interview. Critical thinking and problem solving are really table stakes today. They assume you've got that. What everyone's really looking for are people who can only do their job but invent, reinvent, and re-engineer their job while they're doing it. A recent study by the RAND Corporation found out that among the state tests that are used for accountability, only about 2% of the items on the math tests measure higher order thinking skills. 
98% of the items are, you know, can you apply an algorithm and do the procedure? The problem with that is that quite often people who can identify a particular problem format and crank out an answer or find and guess an answer from a list of five, which schools spend a lot of time on, cannot reason their way through a mathematical application in the real world. We have to prepare students to be resilient, to be thinkers, to be collaborators, to be communicators. We have to prepare them in such a different way. I think there's a sharp trade-off between what can be tested easily on a large scale and what's important in life. Think of a different universe where you're asking kids to invent a science experiment, write a creative essay, come up with an interesting historical perspective on an event they care about. Far more important challenges for a kid, far more aligned with what they need to do in the real world when they graduate, much harder to test and very hard to say you got a 731 on this experiment and somebody else got a 627 on the experiment. So that's the existential trade-off we face in education. Creativity cannot be taught, but it can be cured because to me, Creativity and entrepreneurship and in the spirit to innovate, they all are human nature. We can enhance it, we can make it better, but more importantly, a lot of times we're discouraged by forcing people to do what other people think is right, to force people to find answers, not ask questions, to force people to shoot for answers very efficiently, not ask them to explore. There's some really big questions here is, what should we be teaching? You know, who, is our, who are our major stakeholders? So getting that consensus among all the players, the parents, the teachers, the business community, the politicians, of this is what we want our end product to look like. This is what we want the students coming out prepared to do, not just to know. Until you get that aligned, um, getting tough doesn't matter, because you're getting tough on what? I would argue that beyond the morality of this issue, it's simply a matter of self-interest for all of us. Because if we don't train and teach and really support children from all these backgrounds, they become our responsibility or our fear. So it's about fear. Because we have to teach them about what we consider most important in our society. This is not about something that would be nice to do. This is about the very essence of our future. This is about who we become as a nation. So I want you to, kindergarten teachers, where are you at? All right, kids come Friday, is that right? Okay, so two, two to three weeks after we get started, is it possible, just from that working with those kids for two to three weeks, that you know which kids can already read, which kids don't know their alphabet, which kids know where they live, which kids don't, which kids know how to count, which kids do not, which kids know how to attend a task, which kids do the Randy shuffle, <laughs> which, which kids uh, can, can work well with others, which can't, do you already know that? Amazing! They can do that without a test. Veterans, you remember that, right? You remember when, again, your input as a professional was valued. Now, we're spending a lot of time doing academic testing. Nothing wrong with it, but we're spending a disproportionate amount of time doing that. Where are we teaching problem solving creativity? And what happens is you go to workshops, and because we blame teachers and we blame principals, we say, you need to do this. And you do it. And you go, oh my gosh, when are we go I'm going to find time to do this because I still have to do everything else. We have to think about the system. You all are innovating within your classroom. So it's a systems change. So you can have access to this later on. I'm going to go over this real quick. But we went out and listened to Kansans and asked three questions. If you think of a successful 24-year-old, but pick any number, a young person, how would you describe what a successful young person in Kansas looks like and is? Give us the characteristics, attributes. Second question, what's K-12's role, if any, in developing that person? And the third question, what's higher ed's role, if any? 20 communities, we had an online presence. We then went back out to seven different communities and engaged the business community. So altogether, we were in seven, 27 different communities. 
largest qualitative study ever done in the history of Kansas. Gave the data to Kansas State and our researchers, because it was open in a data and said crunch it. What makes up success based upon what Kansans told us? We then gave that data to the state school board and in October of 15, they launched this new vision. I want to share this with you because this is uniquely where we're headed because Kansans told us to go this way and it's validated by real research. But it will stretch everyone in this room. It will stretch all of us because I'm going to ask you again to think about the system in which you're teaching with, not just your classroom. And I know your mind is on your classroom since the minute you got up this morning because it's, it's happening. All right? This is what Kansans told us. That what make up 70% of the responses, that what make up success is not measured on a standardized test. You believe that, teachers? then why is what has been important from the Commissioner of Education to the State Board of Education to the President of the United States, through a superintendent, through a curriculum director, through a principal, through a coach, through down to you, said, where are your state assessment scores? Where are your MAP scores? Let's list all the schools. Let's list all 33 schools in Shawnee Mission from top to bottom order. It is. It's very measurable. And we love to measure. These other things, problem solving, creativity, grit, perseverance, conscientiousness, honesty, all oh, these are tough things to measure. That's what we want, though, out of our kids. So we asked business people, same question. This is what they said. <coughs> business leaders from Black and Beach to Hallmark to Cerner to mom and pop shops, good year. And I'll never forget, I was in Lawrence when a construction, an owner of a construction company said, Randy, let me tell you a quick story. I hired two young people at $20 an hour to work my construction and said, guys, we start on Monday. On Monday morning, one show, they started at 8 o'clock on Monday morning. On Monday morning, he said one showed up at 8.15 and one showed up at 8.34, the first day of work. He said, I was a little miffed. I said, okay, I was more than a little miffed. But I said to him, guys, we're late. Get your tools. We've got to get on the truck. I'll deal with you when we get to the, web, to, the, to the work site. He said, by 930, one of them was texting on their phone. And then I'll never forget this. He said, at the end of the day, one of the young men came up to me and said, hey, dude, how did I get promoted in your company? <laughs> and I'll never forget this because he was about, from me to you, he had steely blue gray eyes and he said I'm going to quote him he said young man I'm about to fire your ass you're not going to get promoted and then he looked at me and he was just glaring and he said that's the type of kid you're sending me and that's not the type of kid that I want and you know what I did you know what the first emotion I felt which is what all of you would are you kidding me have you seen the parents we're dealing with today or, <laughs> quit blaming me I'm tired of getting beat up, right? But I didn't. I took it. Because he's sharing with me his frustration with what he thinks is a good wage, and I can't get you to show up on time. I can't get you to put your cell phone down. I can't, at the end of the day, you're worried about getting a raise when you won't even work hard for on this day. And I've, I won't tell you, in the two years I've gone out and I've talked to businesses, I've heard this story over and over, they're not saying, can they count back change? Can they read a tape measure? They're saying, they don't have the skill set. I need them to reimagine my company and give value and to think and to problem solve and be creative. And we've been chasing a test score. You see the disconnect? We've been in Henry Ford's world, and they're not in Henry Ford's world anymore. The rest of the world isn't. Here's what Kansan said. I'm just going to give you a high-level summary. Here's some of the takeaways. That we need quality pre-K and that every kid, and that including all-day kindergarten, and in fact, the latest funding formula funds all-day kindergarten for the first time in our history. Yeah, that's a good thing. But we need... We need to have early childhood work to five experiences, social, emotionally, and academically. All right, veterans, 
Do you see more mental health needs in your classroom than you did a decade ago? Yep. Yeah. So, so what's our response been to that? Hey, let's send you to a workshop. <laughs> right? We're talking about trauma-informed. Let's send you to a, a couple-hour workshop on trauma-informed. Let's put that on your plate also. Just like you had to differentiate instruction, because not every kid's coming with the academic skills. They're coming with a wide range of social and emotional skills. Changes need to be made in school culture. Kansan said very clearly, it's time we start appreciate on a stage like this, on senior honors night, that the kid that walks across it and says, I have a scholarship to go to Washburn Tech to be a welder, they ought to be received with the same accolades and intense fervor as a kid that wants to be a pharmacist. All right, you can, I told you this is hard, you can clap all you want, we don't do it. We don't from day one set that up. And some of you here, all of us with our baccalaureate and our masters and our PhDs, you'd, you'd clap and do that until it was your kid saying, I'm thinking about joining the army or I'm thinking about going to be a diesel mechanic. And then there'd be a little bit of a, of a pause. Because for all of us, when you're in Walmart, and you run into someone you know, it's, hey, James, I know graduated last year. What's the question? Where's he going to school? Right? And you want to say, Duke. He's going to Duke. You know? And then the, the second question is, what's he going to study? What's he going to major? Not, he's going to tech school to be a welder. They're equally valuable. New dynamic roles for counselors and social workers in school psychs, that they want them working with kids, not doing master schedules, not doing attendance. And by the way, maybe we ought to hire some. <laughs> so that they can support you in these mental health needs. These are trained people, that a team of those ought to be there. The re recommended ratio for a counselor nationwide is one to 250 kids. In Kansas, we're at one to 550 kids. I was in Atwood, Kansas last spring where I talked to the counselor. She serves seven different school districts. She's on the road more than she ever sees a kid. And we expect to help kids. Okay, fourth grade teachers, I guess it's on you. You see the system? You see it's a system problem. This is not a conspiracy from your principal. We've just not thought about this system. And the system is built on parents that deeply are engaged in their education and kids that have a stable home environment. And where that occurs, the system still works great. Let me ask this, veterans or youngins, how many of you see more parents that are not engaged in school and kids with un more unstable environments? All right, then we've got to change this system while we hold on to some of the past. We need tighter collaboration between schools and businesses. We need community service to play a bigger role. We've talked about that. Kansas said they wanted kids to give back. And maybe the most hard schools need to be reorganized around the kid, not the system. One room schoolhouse. If you were in first grade and you didn't get it today, or even in three months, what happened? You stayed with the teacher for the next seven years, taught by the younger ones to the older ones, right? We talked about that. Not now, you're passing them on to someone. We're not organized around kids, we're organized around the system we created when kids came to town. And we perpetuate that system, not because we're mean people, because we don't know of any other system. We all went to that school. Whilst teaching those schools, and it's not meeting the needs of many of our kids going forward. So here's the basic, what is success? When you boil it down to what Kansans told us, they said, successful young people are happy. Take that to your next PLC data. <laughs> I'm just saying, that was the number one response. How many of you have kids of your own? How many of you have multiple kids of your own? Okay, you ever looked at your spouse at, over dinner and go, where did this one come from? <laughs> Never the first one, right, because we were making it up. 
right? It's just like the first year of teaching. You want to go back and you want to apologize <laughs> to the kids. It's always the second or third one. You go, hey, we're better at raising these kids than we were at the first one, and you're screwing me up, buddy. <laughs> it does, because every kid's so different. But if we were to say, I have a 30-year-old and a 24-year-old, and I can just tell you, at, at age 12 and at age 5, if, you, if I... If you would have asked me, for anyone they're 30 and 24, if they would tell you that they're happy, would you take that as a, as a part of success? I'd have been ecstatic as a parent. How about if they're happy and have a sense of fulfillment? Now we're even deeper, right? How about they also, as what Kansan said, they give back to others. It's not just about them, they're unselfish. And now, all of a sudden, you see that the top three things that we have are not measured on any tests that you've created or that were given to you to measure. And these were the top three responses Kansans gave us. And then they said, yes, we need some skill sets and attributes whoops, to, get, to, to live in the middle class. How about this company? It's not a trick question. What do they do? Yeah, they're college admission testing, right? I was with them last week talking to the vice president. He said, Randy, we have... In 1959, ACT was created when two guys that had started ACT were working at the University of Iowa and got to be such a big company, they spun off and they created their own. They left the University of Iowa. Almost everyone that works at ACT is a PhD. Almost everyone that works there is a psychometrician of some sort, PhD. And he said, we were built upon testing kids to get into college. And here's what we found. I'll share a little bit of this data. Here's what we found. It doesn't predict success. Does not predict success. Think about all the kids, parents, they're in the ACT test prep. Why? Because every college is based in scholarship and mittens on it. And they're saying it only has about a 25 to 30% prediction of success. And then most of that's GPA in college, by the way. Workplace, it's even smaller. So ACT said, there's some research we've found. We realize that the skills taught in traditional academic subjects are simply not enough. And he's saying, I gotta change the culture of PhDs and that's all they know. Sound familiar? He's trying to change the same culture we're talking about, right? Where we're heavy into academic testing only. ACT's developed these four areas, core academic, cross-cutting capabilities, that's your Problem solving, honesty, conscientiousness, grit, perseverance, behavioral skills, and education, career navigation. They say, in combination, these four are what make up success. And they're in combination. And they've even mapped it out grade by grade as to what percent. And not at any grade is future success based on academic higher than 30%. So just think about how much time we spend in, only in the academic domain. Why? Because the system drove us to do that. Here's some other research that backs up what Kansan said. Harvard, Stanford, Carnegie, 85% of what make up success happen in what we call soft skills. It's pretty good, pretty good research. Gallup said if you look at adults, what did they do in high school that made them successful? They, get, they got to do a long-term project that took more than a semester to complete. They got to do an internship or job shadowing where they applied their learning. They were heavily involved in extracurricular activities, and Gallup says only 6% of current kids in American schools get to do all three of those on any given day. But I can tell you what they do, starting in kindergarten. We give them some kind of assessment. Usually it's a Ames Web, Dibbles, or a map, and then we put them in Tier 2 and Tier 3 because we care deeply, and we're going to fix you. And it's because we care. And there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that except with when Gallup says kids ought to get to do what they do best every day, not what they do worst. Right? So veterans, you know this. We've sent a powerful message starting early, early, early to a dyslexic kid, you're not very smart. When most of the CEOs in this country are dyslexic, did you know that? They have a different skill set. Now, I'm not telling you not to work on reading. I'm saying if they got to do what they did best every day and then we worked on reading, they wouldn't see 
That, but what happens is I spend my core on reading, then they get shipped to tier two on reading, then they get shipped to tier three. By the way, we had to take you out of social studies and science and building something and technology because now you had to do that. And that gets really worse as they go up the grades. Someone who encourages my development. Gallup says, caring, not content is king. Caring, not content is king. How many of you believe that one of the biggest things that you can do, that you have as a teacher, are the relationships you can have with kids? Okay? Guess what? Tons of research support that. Kansan said that's important. That's why our role is not going to change as much as some of these others. It's not going to be automated. It's inherently a, a touchy-feely environment. But why, with the most at-risk kids we have, kids that have unstable environments, and parents that are transient, why would we only have you spend one year with them, or in middle school or high school, one period with them? Because that's the way we designed it. That's not the way the one-room schoolhouse was. The teacher was with the same group of kids for eight years, and the same group of parents. Now, you know why we don't do that? Because of the heavy academic burden that's been placed on each grade level that if you had to learn all those different contents it would drive you nuts right you'd have to know all those standards but Gallup along with Kansan said caring not content is king that is research so we have to ask our questions as a system what's prohibiting us from having you spend two or three years with kids nothing except it's harder if we don't if we don't think about reorganizing school we're gonna kill you even more Right? If you ever looped with kids, you know how hard it is. I have kindergartners, and I looped to first, and I looped to second. And what you'll hear from teachers is, God, I get tired. It's not because I know the kids, but I have to learn all this new content every year, right? Well, there's other ways to organize it as we go forward. So here's the vision for Kansas. We're going to lead the world. That's nice. It's really nice. <laughs> yeah. It is. I mean, who cares about Missouri or Oklahoma? I, Joy, my counterpart in Oklahoma, we talk a couple of times a week, and I, I say, you know, Joy, lots, you know, there's lots of ways you can pray at night, and I just keep praying for Oklahoma to keep doing all the stupid stuff they're doing in education. <laughs> you know, 14% of the teachers in, in uh, Coffeyville today come across the border from Oklahoma. Uh, so we're going to lead the world. The key is the success of each student, and you know how hard that is. Not the student achievement. Will you leave that today as you walk out the door? Will you not use the word student achievement to just talk about the success of kids? Will you use the word student success? And will you go back, veterans, and have a conversation with the youngin about all that it takes to help kids successful? Parents, you know how hard this is? How hard this raising kids stuff is? You know how hard this is, teachers? It's more than a 32 on the ACT. And I'm not saying that's not important. Academics are important, but it's more than that. It's a balanced approach, and we've been out of balance. Defining success, here's what the state board's definition, that they have these five in conjunction with each other. They're all equal. How much time in the next two weeks are you going to be spending on civic engagement? compared to reading and mathematics. Why? Because that's what we've been doing. How are we going to teach cognitive skills if we have to add them on to the already crammed day that you have? We're going to have to reorganize our thinking about how school is organized and how school is done. Here's the outcomes the state board's looking at. Social emotional growth measured locally. We don't want that data. You can skew it too easy. We want you to go working on that. Kindergarten readiness, every kid ought to be ready. An individual plan of study focused on career interest. We could spend all day talking about each one of these, but let me just say this. It doesn't do any good, doesn't do any harm. You don't need to ask any elementary kid what they want to be when they grow up. There's no correlation that that will be what they become. But here's what you can start to do. Two major things. Find out what kids love to do and who they are. Oh, I love to create things and build things and be outside. That starts to leave you clues that that kid's probably not going to be an accountant later on in life. 
We don't have to know what. We have to know who. We don't ask even adults who they are and what drives them. That's, that's very, very important. And the other thing, how do you know what you want to be when you grow up if you don't have any schema of what's even out there? And so during the time that we spent on all the efforts simply tutoring more in math and reading, what did we cut? Field trips. Because of time and money, right? You have to put more field trips back in. Kids need more experiences. It's important as we go forward. High school graduation and post-secondary completion are important. I'm going to show you a little bit about this. Is that true? I think it is. Here's my score. Seventy-one percent of the workforce in Kansas needs to be, have some level of post-secondary. Notice this though, not everyone needs a baccalaureate degree. Half of those are certificate and associate. But we're forcing every kid into a college preparatory, go to four years of college. We're forcing them. From the way we've organized simply, simple academics to middle school and high school. If you don't believe me, go ask your high school counterparts. Every kid in Shawnee Mission takes ninth grade English. The same ninth grade English. Oh yeah, we may have the honors English, and we may have the remedial English, but it's still the same English. So think about this. You can challenge your high school counterparts. They'll hate this when you ask them. So you go to the English department and say, hey, does every kid need to learn the scarlet letter this year? How many of you thought that sucked? Let's just be honest. <laughs> you know, I'm a history guy. I can teach Sherman's March to the Sea longer than Sherman March to the Sea. I get it, right? We need certificate and associate degree. Here's Shawnee Mission data. I'm sitting in one of the best school districts in the state, and I know this is kind of blurry. You can get a copy. Yellow, high school graduation, over a five-year period, 2011 to 2015. Five-year period. All right, it's a five-year average. 91% of Shawnee Mission kids graduate high school. Are you excited about that? You should be excited about that. Yes, you, have, you played a big role in that. You should, the state average is 86, so you're five points above the state average. That's something to celebrate. We don't celebrate enough. But I want you to also think about the 9% of kids that never get to see a stage. They don't make it. And the odds of them living in the middle class in Kansas are less than 10%. Is that okay? No, you know it's not. And you can't take on the burden simply as you as a teacher in the classroom of all that, because you do. You go at home at night and you already know the kid, the fourth grader who lost their enthusiasm, and you can see it, right? You can see it in them. We've got to think about a different system. The red bar, two years out of high school, how many kids are still going to school or have graduated? So those would be your associate or credential. That's the red bar. Over a five-year average, that's 64%. And the blue is simply taking the red times your graduation rate, and that's what we call the five-year effective rate. Now this is important. Your five-year effective rate in Shawnee Mission is 58%. Statewide, it's 44 so again, I want you to celebrate that, all right? And this is how we would celebrate in the, in the past. You'd jump up and down, we'd have a press release, we'd want to get all the media, and you'd say, we annihilated the state average, and you did, all right? We should have some cookies and, you know, <laughs> a cold adult beverage, all right? Well, I, we, we should do that, because I don't think we do it enough. But we need 70 to 75% of our kids to have done it and you're at 58. You're 15% below what the current job market is. And I want to ask this question, why aren't they going on to be successful? And that's a more complicated answer, isn't it, than just a test score. There are lots of factors. Could be money, can't afford it. Could be I chose the wrong school. Could be I didn't have the academic skills. Could be, did you see the roommate they gave me at KU? <laughs> There's lots of factors to this, right? There's, ACT said there are basically four. You know, do they have those four areas? This is important. Every, by the way, 
Every high school here has this data, and the feeder back to you. They have every kid from 2010 to 2017. We've given them every kid and where they've gone or not gone. So we can backward map that if they were in the Shawnee Mission District all the way back to you. And we can start to glean some factors. But let me tell you this. The number one factor in elementary schools here in Shawnee Mission about whether or not you're going to go on to be successful is what? What's the number one factor? Nope, it's something you can easily measure, and you do measure. Attendance. Attendance. Those students that miss more than 10% of the days of school have an 80% greater chance of not graduating high school or going on to be successful. And you know that today. So the question is, and you know our traditional response to that is, why won't they do something about truancy? How about if we have to change something? You know, in the high poverty areas of our state, they're talking about busing kids differently. They're talking about picking kids up differently. How about kids, you guys have this? I know you do. You have kids in your school that will change schools five times this year and they'll cir circle back? You know, my, my wife's an elementary principal. Just before school was out in May, she got two new fourth graders. Two weeks before school was out. Fourth grade teacher came to her, Debbie, what parents would move their kids with two weeks left of school? You know the answer, those that have no choice. Right, because we wouldn't do that. Those that have no choice. So we have to think about this. All these factors make that up. Now you know there's other factors called risk. So we are also looking in every community about the risk factors that every community has. And have you noticed in Shawnee Mission that your risk factors are growing? You are not the Shawnee Mission of 15 years ago. Neither is Olathe, and Blue Valley is rapidly going that way too. None of our communities are. It's changing. The demographics are shifting. Th these play a role. They play a huge role in student success. These are the factors you don't control for the most part that play a huge role. And we've even charted how school districts would do on the post-secondary success. Here's a district that scored extremely high. Here's a district that scored extremely low, but they're doing just as we would predict them to do given their risk factors. You're slightly outproducing your risk factors. You're doing a better job than what we would predict you to do, just slightly, but again, you ought to jump up and down about that. Because for too long, Janet will know this, Janet's a Turner bear, golden bear. I watch, I watch the newspaper, though, compare Turner to Piper. You couldn't compare two more diverse communities than Turner and Piper. It's like comparing, it's like comparing Shawnee Mission East football team to the state championship eight-man football team, right? So if I, if I was in Tesco, one of the smallest schools, and I just won the state championship in football, have every kid coming back in the coach, do you think I picked up the phone to schedule Shawnee Mission East? No, because size matters, right? That's why we have classifications, but not the way we've looked at test scores. We just put everyone in the same basket. This starts to, to equalize that. So there's people out producing, there's people under producing. And we know that. That data is on your website, on your report card. So I want to end with this little thought. We've likened this trip, this vision, to landing a man on the moon. And uh, we're not too far from it, but tomorrow we're going to do something pretty special. Because veteran teachers, I'm getting old. I don't know how much more time I've got to give to this. I'm trying to give everything I have. But we've got to stop talking and start doing. So you know who these guys are? It's your history test for today. This is the original Mercury 7 astronauts. Most famous, maybe, is John Glenn, who just passed away last December. John Glenn, Alan Shepard, Gus Grissom, Deke Slater. We're going to announce seven Mercury astronaut districts tomorrow that have volunteered. We had 29 districts apply. They had 80% of their faculty say we want to do it. They had a vote of their union, said we want to do it, and they had a public school board vote. And we're going to choose them to reorganize school. And that's our timeline.
completely reorganize the system, not the teachers. We're not going to fix the teachers. There's nothing to fix there. We're going to reorganize school together with the parents, with the community, together with teacher voice, teacher leadership. Not top down. Teacher voice, teacher leadership. So I'll end with this. The actual moonshot is wonderful, inspirational, poetic, beautiful, involved, great technical challenges, genuine heroism. It brought the world together. But think about the Polynesian Islander on the dugout canoe, deciding one day they were going to go that way. No one had ever been that way before. No one even knew if there was anything that way before. It was amazing, and it changed the world. People can set their minds to magical, seemingly impossible ideas, and then through science and technology, bring them to reality. And that then sets other people on fire, that other things that look impossible might be accomplishable. Galileo is such a hero, you know, in Thinking Big, and what he represents to me is both curiosity and wonder that humanity had, that he had, that pushed him and drove himself to invent and work on the first telescopes that allowed us to see the moon, and here we are. These aviation pioneers were, were figuring it out as they went. No one really knew how to build an airplane, right? No one knew how to fly an airplane. It was amazing and crazy and wonderful, and they wanted to explore. Many years ago, the great British explorer George Mallory, who was to die on Mount Everest, was asked why did he want to climb it. He said because it is there. There's so many challenges in the world and you can feel daunted by that, you know, and sort of oppressed by that. Or you kind of say, how might we think differently about this? Everyone else in the world is working on the next 10%. If you can be the one that delivers that 10 times improvement, you have a chance to really change things. If you want cars to run at 50 miles per gallon, fine, you can retool your car a little bit. But if I tell you it has to run on a gallon of gas for 500 miles, you have to start over. You need a lot of courage in this work and you need a lot of persistence. One of the things that's really critical is not only having the courage to keep trying every day or thinking big, even if you don't really 100% believe it's possible, like you might think this might be possible. Have the courage to try. That's how the greatest things have happened. You don't spend your time being bothered that you can't teleport from here to Japan because there's a part of you that thinks it's impossible. Moonshot thinking is choosing to be bothered by that. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. Humanity's progress has been a series of amazing, audacious things, from the very small and personal up to the great, big, and grand, and we are a species of moonshots. And to me, that's like the really amazing, poetic, and inspirational thing. I think our ambitions are a glass ceiling on what we can accomplish. When you find your passion, you're unstoppable. You can make amazing things happen. It's been true through all of history. I believe in the human spirit, and I believe that there are always going to be crazy people who will get out of bed one morning and say, you know what, I think I can build a space elevator, and let's go and do it. But I think that if we become afraid to take these great big risks, we stop inspiring people. We stop achieving things. And the biggest nightmare scenario is that we won't have what it takes to solve the really big challenges. When Kennedy said that we would put a man on the moon, it's about the fact that he said, we don't know how to do this yet, and we're going to do it anyway. And that sense chills up everybody's spine. Because if that happens, what couldn't we do? I'm so excited about the start of this school year, and, it's, and the reason is because of you and your commitment to the kids in this district and really all the teachers and their commitment across the state. On behalf of Steve and Janet and myself, if there's ever anything we can do to help or get out of the way of, we're here to serve you any way that we can. I want to say you're gonna have a wonderful year, but as you go back, grab your principal, your assistant principal, curriculum people, parents, say we have to have a discussion. You have to have a discussion broader than my, my classroom about how school is going to look. And then we can start to design it together. So thanks. Have a great day and a great school year, everyone.